Sunday afternoon. But the streets are deserted on purpose. This is a city after atomic radiation. A dying city, with the last stragglers being cleared from the streets for the filming of Neville Shute's novel, On the Beach. Except You're on Books and Arts Daily. I'm Michael Cathcart, and I'm talking to Gideon Haig and to Loris Johnson about uh, On the Beach, the movie and the book On the Beach, and also about the documentary they've both been involved in. Now, Lawrence, you've uh, directed this documentary, Fallout, which is all about the making of the film. I have to say I'm quite excited for us because we've been able to tell this story. I mean, it's part of Australia's literary and cinematic history that not many people know about. And um, and also, you know, there was there's never been a film about Neville Shute or Stanley Kramer. So there are also the, the uh, biographical aspects of particularly yeah. Neville Shute. And by the time in the mid-20th century, he was one of the highest paid novelists there was, mm. as he also reminded people he wrote A Town Like Alice as well, which he sort of saw as a, a bit of a pot boiler, but it made money for him. But because he was so... Um, He felt so strongly about um, what had happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, combined with other things to do with radiation that are being discovered as a um, adjunct, you know, as a following that. He wrote on the beach as this obviously warning to the world. So the producer and director is this American Stanley Kramer. How did he come across the book? Do we know? Well, the book was about seller. Yeah, it yeah. sold a hundred thousand copies in its first six weeks in the US. It went straight to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. It was serialized in a several score of, of newspapers. Eventually it sold four million copies. My argument is that it's probably the most significant Australian novel of all in the sense that it tackles the sort of defining sort of moral and political issue of the age and puts it in an Australian setting, an extraordinarily subversive idea. It sort of takes this subverts this idea that we've always had that we're a long way away from the rest of the world and you know we're sort of beholden to the rest of it yes it does because Australia is the most important country in the world momentarily at the moment of its greatest powerlessness yes it is unusual to have a story where it's not London or New mm. York or Tokyo mm. that stands for the world mm. it's it's Melbourne mm. in fact it's people on the beach at Frankston mm. which is a mm. you know seaside suburb why did Kramer want to make the film? I mean, you said it was a message film. Let's go deeper into what it was that's really galvanising him. Well, he was attracted to the novel for those reasons, and I think one of the things about the novel that is great about it is it's actually very simply written, mm. but it actually um, explores incredibly provocative issues. The most present one is the young couple who just had a baby, and um, then in 1957 or now... The idea that governments can make decisions about war that affect civilians to the point where they have to kill their own child and then take suicide pills Mm. for them to have some kind of ending to their life is a pretty horrible concept. And it's very strong. And um, and I think, you know, those elements drew Kramer to it. There's also the emotional resonance of the relationships in the novel between particularly Ava Gardner and Gregory Peck's characters, which I'll call them rather than the novel characters because they're easier to explain. But, um, you know, Kramer was involved with obviously creating and, and uplifting the romantic aspects to that. And it's, it's incredibly moving when, um, you know, Gregory Peck's character comes back from the Northern Hemisphere and there's a great sequence in the film in the submarine where all the men discover that actually the world is annihilated mm. and they have to come back under the water back to Melbourne and, and and essentially you know romantically Gregory Peck has to come back to Ava Gardner and he, in the film he obviously gives himself to her and she to him um, at the end of the world I mean that romantic premise is mm. is very strong I think and you know, it's incredibly poignant and the way that Kramer came here and brought the production and really had a lot of integrity, I think, about Shoot's novel, even though there were differences and, and Shoot didn't like the film. Kramer's done a wonderful job. Yeah. And it's, it's, and so it's quite disturbing. It's mm. so prescient too, isn't it? Because the film the book and the film both are created in the fifties. It's set, you know, just a few years in the future, nineteen sixty four. In fact, the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred in 1962. Yes. So so the world came very close to exactly the scenario that this film imagined. And I think that the real coup of Shoot's novel and and as a result the film is that it happens, is that that it's set after everything's happened. It's the epilogue to the the end of the world. And everyone is absolutely powerless to to prevent what's the fate that's going to befall them. And there's, in a sense, just ticking off the days until their inevitable final demise. And as Osborne, the scientist in the film, says, um, he's sort of the shoot equivalent, his science character who provides probably the most rational perspective on things, he said, well, you always knew that you were going to die. Now you just know when. Do you have a personal stake in, in this message? Are you, do you share this concern? Well, um, I 
I'm, I'm a filmmaker, um, I guess, and a storyteller. I'm not a nuclear activist. But, um, you know, one of the reasons the film was made at the moment was because the world that Shoot explored, mm. which were the, you know, the, the dubious and, I guess, nefarious nature of um, nuclear energy and weaponry mm. and how that is used or misused, um, underlies it. And basically because of what's happened recently, you know, with things like Fukushima, um, we have a world where governments, again, control things like going to war. They, they control certain resources. And we don't necessarily have the knowledge of those resources completely. And nobody knows what accidents mm. can prevail and, you know, and happen. So I guess the message for the film, Fallout film, underlying is, is that we, it's like, you know, we have a lot of dialogue about climate change, but there are other things in the world to think about too that may affect, the, you know, future generations it's interestingly it's not a cold war artifact it, the, the the film specific the, the the book specifically proposes a nuclear conflagration breaking out not through ideological differences but through an accidental escalation of a small-scale conflict in the middle east we all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous since it may be used against us we must get ready for it just as we are ready for many other dangers that are around us all the time so it's not actually a, a disarmament film or, a, or a, not actually a, a pacifist book. It's a non-proliferation mm. um, scenario. And if anything, that's, that's, the, that's the world in which, into which we've been born. I watched it again last night, actually, and um, the movie, I mean. And uh, it's very odd to see Ava Gardner, Anthony Perkins and Donna Anderson, this young American, playing Australians. In fact, mm -hmm. I'd forgotten that Anthony Perkins was the Australian, that he was an Australian. Mm -hmm. When I saw, mm -hmm. oh, he's, he's wearing an Australian mm -hmm. Navy uniform. Mm -hmm. he's, in a, he's in the Australian mm -hmm. Navy. Um, did it rankle at the time with, with audiences to see these are Hollywood stars playing Aussies? People just accepted it because mm. it was Hollywood and that was the Hollywood machine. Yeah. I think particularly for Melbourne audiences, from what I've heard, that um, because of the circus of the filming here, when they went to see it at the premiere at the Regent, were quite shocked because even though they knew what On the Beach was about in terms of its subject, the way that uh, Kramer photographed it, directed it and the mood of the film is, you know, it's very kind of realistic and dour. Mm. And to see their own city portrayed in that way, mm. um, I think was probably quite disturbing. Let's talk very briefly about Neville Shute, because he's quite a character. Oh, he's an extraordinary man, yeah. Uh, I didn't know very much about his provenance when I, when I came to write about him. He was a Briton. Uh, he was an engineer, fundamentally. He always looked upon himself as an engineer. He worked on the R100 um, airship project. He founded a, um, uh, an aerospace company called Airspeed. And in the evenings, he just started writing popular adventure fiction, a lot of it with aviation settings. And he started to grow more and more ambitious and he began to entertain the idea of the idea of a an author and a popular author having sort of um, educating the public in important uh, sort of moral or political or, or, or military issues in 1939 he wrote a very interesting book called what happened to the Corbetts which is actually about uh, the threat of strategic bombing to Britain uh, and it, it follows an ordinary family um, trying to survive what looks very much like a blitz from above. And, uh, and this became a kind of a recurrent trope in Shoots fiction. The, he was still living, of, sorry, he was still living in England. He was, stage, yeah. he was. The ordinary person in extraordinary circumstances. And in a sense, On the Beach, I think, is a bit of an updating of that idea. The ordinary person in the most extraordinary circumstances of all, trying to come to terms with not just... Uh, a military threat from, from a visible enemy, but one from an invisible enemy that's completely irrefutable and irresistible. Hmm. So he, he moved from England to Australia. He bought a farm he did. At, outside he did. Melbourne and, uh, and continued writing these he books. He sort of fell out of sympathy with Britain in the late 1940s as the Attlee government came to power. Politically, he was probably a libertarian, uh, he was sort of anti-democratic too. He believed that, you know, an elite, an intellectual elite should run every society. A lot of them should be engineers because he had a fundamental belief in the efficacy of, uh, of, of engineering. But he came to Australia because he flew out here in the late 1940s uh, and liked the country very much. He thought it would be sort of Br the best of Britain in the, in the southern seas and brought his family out here in, in 1950. Mm. So as we wind up, he'd sold the film rights. He had no control over the film and it really upset mm. him. Yes. Well, it was it was pretty close to him. I think for the reasons we said earlier is that the subject matter coming out of, um, you know, the previous novel, the Corbett's novel, you know, and him interested mm. in the, the goodness of people and, and under states of complete adversity, I think um, particularly that issue for him being... Um, 
muddied or tampered with in the way that Kramer did, he, you know, Neville should have very strong moral compass and, you know, Kramer took it into a realm that he wasn't, he just didn't agree with. Well, the story has always been that he was so upset about mm. the movie. He'd worked himself in such a state, he already had a bad mm. heart, and that it finished him off. Mm. Well, it, it did. He, you know, he, to be realistic about it, he had a series of heart attacks and ill health throughout his life. But again, he did stress himself out so much about it. And as his daughter has said, you know, he, he was quite apoplectic about mm. the um, whole thing. Well, look, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the uh, documentary immensely. And it gave me such a wonderful opportunity, such a wonderful excuse to go back and watch the movie too. So... It was a double pleasure. Thank you. Lawrence Johnson is the director of the new documentary Fallout and Gideon Haig is a writer who's featured in the film. And uh, Gideon's article is really worth looking at. It's called Shoot the Messenger, as in Neville Shoot. Nice joke. That was published in the monthly and it's pretty easy to track out online.